Good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Habiba Abdelail, and I'm Egyptian social and women's, ad women's rights advocate. I'm doing my second master's in public administration and nonprofit management here at OU, for those who do not know me. Uh, I did my first master's in communication and development, women and gender studies major. I have been volunteering and working in many NGOs, civic initiatives, and social institutions in Egypt and the United States, such as Imprint, Harasmab, the UN Women, the AHA Foundation, and the Guta Institute. I'm also, as you all know, the graduate assistant for Ohio University Women's Center. I love you all. <laughs> I earned my bachelor degree in 2012 in applied arts and worked as a textile engineer for two and a half years in a factory and big corporation before shifting my whole career to advocacy work and fighting gender-based violence. The Egyptian society was and still a patriarchal and male dominant society. Working in a factory was very challenging for me. It was and still a male dominated sphere and women are not allowed to work in it. So for example, I could not work in the textile manufacturing process. They made all female um, employees work either in the design field or the customer service department because those are the two departments where you will be in an office, in a closed office. I tried to work in the production field and the manager told me we do not hire women in the department because it's hard work and night shifts and women cannot do that. Working there for two and a half years, I faced a lot of discrimination and sexual harassment incidents. Such, a, such an environment made my working experience really challenging. That made me believe that there is something wrong with that system and that we as women are not being treated fairly and we do not have various options because either to work in what they have chosen for you or you do not get a job. That was in early 2012, aligned with me being involved with the social activism movement that started with the uprising, and then bring us to the uprising or the revolution. So let me start with a question. Anyone here heard about the Arab Spring or the Egyptian revolution or the Arab uprising? And if yes, what have you heard? If you want to share in the chat or if you want to open the mic and speak, you are welcome to. I have heard about it from you um, and you spoke about it eloquently a couple years ago when we were still in the office. Um, and it has stayed in my brain ever since. Uh, the, the highlights that I remember, unfortunately, um, are your details about the um, sorry, about the um, the gatherings and the protests and the horrific, I think you call them circles of hell, um, and the men and women that had to come down and help protect the women that were just um, fighting for the use of their voice. Thank you. I can see in the chat that people are saying, yes, I have heard of the Arab Spring, studied it a bit. That's Amazing. I know about the Arab Spring a little bit, and a lot of my knowledge has been, like a lot of people are also saying, has been given to me from you. But something that I think is interesting is that, like, when I talk to other people about it or I mention it to other people, there are very few people who know anything about it. Um, and that's kind of upsetting. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. So anyone else before I start talking more about the Arab Spring? That's actually a lot of information. So like uh, I did my, a great job letting everyone know about the Arab Spring. And to your point, Taylor, I think it was 10 years from today. And that's like a long time ago. So I, I feel like I was furious first when people knew, said that they do not know what is the Arab Spring is, but I realized that it was 10 years ago. So I understand why some people do not know anything about it or do not even remember. 
So let me take like let me give you a kind of a brief about the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring or the Arab Uprising, it started actually in Tunisia in 2010 and it moved around to other countries like Egypt, Libya, Yemen, uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria. Uh, I'm going to be focusing more on the Egyptian revolution because I was there and uh, I witnessed most of what happened during the revolution. So the Egyptian revolution started on Tuesday, January 25th, 2011, and it lasted 18 days, or that was the official announced number, but it contained for four years of continuous protesting. It began as a popular uprising when millions of protesters from various religious backgrounds demanded the Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak, to leave the office. People went to the streets asking for social justice, bread, and freedom of the dictatorship. More than 5,000 people were killed in the protests from 2012 to 2016, with thousands injured and arrested. I will play a short video. I will play a short video to give detailed information about the revolution's reasons and what happened in the last 10 years. I think we can share the link in the chat. Uh, and you can watch it, and then we can get back and discuss the video. Okay, so any thoughts or comments on the video that you want to share? I thought that was a really incredible video, Habiba. Thank you so much for sharing. It provides a really good overview of what happened, I think. Um, as well as discussing the ways in which um, I think it was very uh, it was very devastating to see how you know this incredible movement that started um, in Tunisia and, and then took hold in, in Egypt um, you know while there was like, initial success getting the president out of power um, like the dictator out of power to see how then it just turns over to military control you know is definitely not a big win so I thought it was it was very interesting to hear about that and kind of like see the perspective from folks that participated. So thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. And responding to your comment, actually, that's why I'm focusing today on the Egyptian revolution, because each country had its own uh, experience with the revolution. Like Tunisia, it got so well, and like they ended up with uh, changing the whole regime and the system and making policies and new laws. But in... In Syria, it went really bad and it went with like a civil war. And so, yeah, that's why um, I'm focusing more on the Egyptian revolution, because that's what where I was there. And like I like I mentioned, it's a different experience from a country to another. And it all started with the same goal, with, which is like getting rid of the dictatorship that we have been under for more than 30 years. And it ended in a different way in each country. Let me share a part of my experience with you as a part of the Egyptian revolution. I joined the uprising from the first week. I was, I think, 19 years old and I was still doing my bachelor's degree. I used to tell my family that I'm in my classes while I was inhaling smoke from the gas bombs the police used to attack us. All the protests and incidents you saw in the video, I was there. I witnessed it all. I wanted to be a part of the change that I believed should happen now. I was arrested twice during protests, but I was lucky, honestly, to get released because thousands of people didn't and still in prison because they participated in the revolution. I escaped, I escaped death more than once, and I remember that one incident that happened when the military attacked Tahrir Square and I was separated from my friends and we started running and the smoke was everywhere and I ended up in the middle of Tahrir Square looking at, at it and seeing the smoke and people screaming and I just froze and I couldn't move and I thought okay that's it and that's when I I saw an officer shooting at me and I thought that's it that's how I'm gonna die but a guy came out of nowhere and he took my hand and we started running together till we got out of Tahrir Square. And then he left me and I never and still do not know his name, but I still remember his face. That's a 
like an example of how Tahrir Square was our home and hope. People who didn't know each other uh, supported and saved each other because we believed in the same thing and in the same goal and we wanted the same dream. As I mentioned before, I, I, I was going to talk about the anti-sexual violence movement that started during the during the protests and during the revolution and, and continued after. Let me take a step back and tell you more about sexual violence in Egypt. So sexual violence and street harassment has been widespread in Egypt throughout the years, even before the revolution started. According to the UN Women's Study, the UN Women's Study in 2013, a sample of more than 2,000 girls and women across Egypt found that 99% had experienced verbal or physical sexual harassment. 99%. That's like all women in Egypt. In 2017, Cairo was named as the world's most dangerous city for women by Reuters Foundation. I remember a famous high-profile mass sexual assault incident that took place before the revolution in downtown Cairo in 2006, when a group of men sexually harassed and formed the circle of hell. Let me explain to you what is the circle of hell. So this is when a large crowd of men attack multiple women or one woman and start harass, strip, and rape them, sometimes even with sharp knives. What was memorable about this incident is that the video got published on one of the activist blogs because in 2006 we, we didn't have Facebook yet or any of the social media platforms. So most of the, like most of the bloggers and the activists used to post social problems and social incidents on their own blogs. You could see in the video a police officer car busting by the incident and hearing the women screaming and not intervening. And they just continued their way without helping or trying to ask what is happening here. That made me question the state violence against women and why they are not reacting against it or in intervening to stop it. Different kinds of gender-based violence happened in Egypt for years and some organizations already was trying to work on it before the revolution, such as Nazra for Feminist Studies, the New Women's Foundation, and the Center for Egyptian Women Legal Center, with no attention from either the government or the society itself. So what happened? When the revolution started in 2011, and people had more access to the internet, and like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube started uh, uh, going on, people started using those social media platforms as a social activism tool. We started hearing about violence. People began to tweet their stories and to highlight and to take videos and to post and start the conversation about it. There have been hundreds of sexual harassment and rape incidents during the revolution and in the, in the 18 days and after, and no one talked about it except for the intervention groups that started to intervene immediately to stop it. At first, it was the state violence against women to stop women from participation. Uh, because of the, the Egyptian society depends more on women because like women is the symbol of the family in the Egyptian society. So they believed if they threatened women and if they made women afraid as a cons like as a as a as a consequences like her whole family would not participate and that can be shown in the survivors stories it was at the beginning of the 18 days it was a typical scenario step by step of what the offenders did and what exactly how they attacked the survivors but then it got out of control. During one of the protests, I was sexually harassed by someone and I did not react because I didn't understand what just happened and because I believe that uh, this is Tahrir Square and no one is gonna do this. And I be and be because also there wa were a lot of people, so I, I couldn't recognize who did that. When I went home, I saw a famous film director in a video on Facebook from Tahrir Square saying that it's safe space and no sexual harassment, robbery or any crime. And he is, was asking people to join. 
and to participate. I know he had a good intentions to encourage people to join, but I and I almost believed him that uh, it's uh, Tahrir Square is safe space and there is no sexual harassment if I wasn't just got harassed. Then I started searching on Facebook and then when I, that when I saw that many women were telling their sexual assault stories in the protests and in Tahrir Square. Young female and male activists decided to stop that because they wanted Tahrir Square to be safe for everyone. And that was when they created an event on Facebook and Twitter asking people to join for a women march in Tahrir Square to make a statement that women are here and we have the right to be in the streets as men. Unfortunately, I didn't participate in that march and I heard after that many offenders attacked it and many women got sexually harassed and got beaten. When I started following the activists who had this event on Facebook, I got connected to them and we started our first meeting to think about how to stop this from happening again. And that was the beginning of me joining the anti-sexual violence movement. And that day was a turning point for my personal and professional life. That action. So I believe the uprising created the context that helped highlight sexual harassment and exposed the government's method to threaten women and discourage them from participating in the public spheres and public protests. At first, various activists and citizens started documenting, like I mentioned, like the, on their blogs and recommending the incidents and posting it on social media. And actually, that effort helped to highlight how women face actual sexual violence for their political participation. In 2012, three social initiatives, Basma or Imprint, Basma, it's in Arabic, which means imprint in English, Shufta uh, Taharush and the Dada Taharush, Opantage and Tahrir bodyguards, started to intervene directly against the sexual harassment and assault that occur in public spaces between 2011 and 2014. I was part of those intervention groups and I witnessed the development of those grassroots groups from being only a reaction against mass assaults into more organized, planned, and strategic working nonprofit organizations. In the movement, we used to have two teams one physical intervention group that used to get inside the circles of hell, inside the protests, and get women outside of the rape or sexual assault incidents and get them the physical and psychological support they needed. Another team we had for advocacy inside Tahrir Square and to give out our hotline numbers, which were our personal phone numbers, basically, to report any incident they will witness. All of that happened with a complete absence of the government and the police force. Even the hospitals had orders not to accept any injuries coming from the protests or Tahrir Square. We had thousands of fights in hospitals because they refused to accept survivors' cases because they believed they deserve it because they are participating in the protests. Imagine all of those challenges, but that made us actually more stubborn to help and support women. We wanted a new beginning in all terms, and that when we started being more organized, we used to meet in cafes, in some of our friends' houses, in the streets, to develop new ideas of intervention and prevention methods that the government and the police ironically used later to imp and implemented on campuses after a couple of years. As I mentioned before, I worked with several initiatives, but I wanna focus on BASMA slash imprint experience. In 2012, BASMA started as a voluntary movement, trying to create safe spaces for women in public areas without discrimination or exclusion. I officially joined them at the end of 2012. Imprint was and still the closest to my heart. I started with them as a regular advocate volunteer and I ended up as the executive director and one of the co-founders when we registered it as a nonprofit leader. We started as a team of six volunteers and gradually the number of volunteers reached 500 in three different regions in Egypt.
I came from a family that always put men first. I was raised and told that I got harassed because of my behavior or the way I am dressed. I can rem I remember the first time I got harassed when I was 12 years old and I went home and I told my mom what happened and she told me maybe because you were walking in the street or maybe because you were laughing in the street and she kept giving excuses for my attacker and at some point I believed it I believed it was my fault till I joined Basma and Basma for me was a space for me to challenge those ideas and our social norms I met a lot of other women who had the same perspective some of them believed it like me and some didn't we talked for hours and we had tons of conflicts and we laughed and planned and we evolved together we were attacked by our neighbors several times because they didn't believe in what we are doing and they didn't believe that women and men should be in a closed place together we got arrested a couple of times doing our advocacy campaigns in the streets what i love about imprint or basma that i got to see the change and the development of this book which was known for its intervention patrols and awareness campaigns in cairo metro and street, city streets first but then we included we included discussing social norms and gender rules we wanted to understand more what is happening and why what is coming from and why people keep blaming victims we focused on by standard intervention and raising community awareness of women's rights and our focus was to stop sexual harassment by giving workshops training and street art campaigns we ended up doing a partnership with the UN women as they heard about our work and wanted us to be the leading organization to implement their safe cities program in 2013 Cairo University, which is the leading public university in Egypt, made us the main trainers for their sexual violence prevention program that we helped them to create and draft the policy in collaboration with other organizations. One of them is Harassmap, which is another organization I worked for and I'm going to talk about it later. As we developed a policy for schools and universities to apply it as a template to prevent sexual harassment on university campuses harassment so harassment was this my second stage of in my journey and i started working at harassment in 2015 till 2017 as a program coordinator then the manager of the safe schools and universities program honestly i joined Harass map to learn more about street harassment and project management for social change and to implement whatever I'm going to learn from them in imprint. <laughs> Harass map was more structured and professional. It focused on collaboration and policy making with public universities across Egypt. I managed to reach out to different university administrations to collaborate and implement this policy from 2015. By the end of 2017, we had three central public universities, including Cairo University, joining the program and enforcing the policy, starting investigation units to receive reports and cases against sexual harassment. OK, so today and what happened to this movement after the, all of those years? This movement met challenges in 2017 due to restrictions brought by a law that was introduced as a severe security crackdown on civil society demonstrating the egyptian government's intention to suppress independent groups the ngo law affected our work affected small initiatives and organizations to obtain funding and apply for grants without being accused of receiving foreign funding or committing treason the organizations that are still working are restricted by the government's law and regulations that make their community outreach work impossible and the beginning of 2017 we had to shut down Bosma for security concerns as we were all afraid of getting arrested and we were afraid for our volunteers to get arrested uh, under this 
law. Harassma had to shut down their community outreach department completely, and now they are working as consultant trainers only. Despite Egypt progressive political and civic activism during and after the revolution, Egyptian women continue being attacked by state policies under the current regime. Depressing, right? All of that work and a small law ended everything. But let me, I, I like to look at the positive side of it and I like to look on the impact we did. And despite the limited gains, the anti-sexual violence movement actually added women's rights to the social agenda by developing techniques to work with the government, public administrators, and policymakers. As a result of this movement, women also spoke out on other issues affecting them, resulting in this state after 20 years of work imposing harsher penalties against female genital mutilation, which is one of the main forms of violence against women in Egypt. Also, in terms of legal reforms, through awareness and the advocacy campaigns we made, the movement successfully pressured the state into changing the sexual assault law in 2014. The revolution and the movement shaped me professionally and personally into the woman and leader I am today. I believe the movement initiated a space for me and for other Egyptian women from different classes and fields of work to participate in the public domain, which before the revolution was not even hard, sometimes it was impossible. And it helped us to fight the violence we faced daily. Let me share with you what I, what I learned through my leadership journey in fighting sexual assault. I believe after all of those years, and I learned it in the hard way, screaming, and shaming and calling people names will not get you anywhere. You need the people to understand what you are talking about and what do you want for your cause to be heard. You have the right to be angry and mad, but you also need to learn what to do with this anger and take that anger and make it work for your cause. It's a challenging process, especially when it comes to inequalities and injustices. And I cannot say I'm there yet, but I can say that I saw the consequences of excluding people and shaming people and its impact. And I'm trying to be more inclusive and patient and tolerant. The second thing I learned is your mental health and well-being come first. Activism and leadership can be a draining journey. I like to say what the flight attendant always says in an emergency. You need to make sure to put on your oxygen mask first before helping others. You cannot help anyone if you cannot breathe yourself. Thank you all for having me today. And now I will open to questions. Habiba, I have a question for you. Sure. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I know folks in the chat were just talking about how courageous you are and really thank you for sharing your experiences. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for folks who want to get involved with this type of work, but really are brand new, right? We, the, um, the situations we have in the United States are different than in Egypt, but I'm wondering how, how do people get involved with this kind of work and how should they start? Uh, I think... For me, honestly, it started with me thinking about what I want to work on and then searching for the organizations that are doing that job and then volunteering for them. So the first step was like knowing exactly what I want to work on. Like my passion was fighting violence against women. So I started searching for organizations that are on the same purpose. And then I volunteered with them. I started by volunteering to understand what is happening and how they are doing the job. And then it, it kind of developed from there. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? You can put it in the chat or unmute yourself, excuse me. 
Habiba, um, thank you so much for sharing all of this and in, in your incredible experience. This is really um, impressive the way that you got involved and were able to create so much intense change. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to some of the barriers, either in um, like creating and founding your NGO, getting it officialized basically, um, and then also um, like pushing forward legislation, because I think that is kind of the ultimate goal of advocacy. And it's, it's so incredible that you were able to do that. Thank you. So it was a long process for our like initiative to be a nonprofit organization. And it took us like two or three years. We wanted it to still be an initiative without registering it because we wanted to avoid all the hustle of like the being a, in, into the system and the bureaucratic system. But then we realized we cannot talk to official institutions and organizations without being an, or, an official organization. And people will not listen to you unless you have a piece of paper. So we decided, OK, if it's that what what is required for us to be heard, OK, let's register the organization. And it took like two years for us to like to get people to accept to take the risk of being co-founders of a nonprofit organization in Egypt under this kind of security issues. And uh, it took some time for us to get the work done with the government. But once we got registered, you can see the power of this paper when whenever we started talking to like universities officials or schools officials they started listening because now we are an official organization and we have like the um, i don't know like the credibility uh, and it helped us actually it helped us a lot to do our work and to get inside universities and schools and to do our campaigns and workshops uh, before that we used to depend on like student organizations to like uh, have an uh, event and we can co-sponsor it and they can have us as like a co-sponsor but it was really hard so after like registering as a nonprofit, it made our life way easier yeah and in terms of the logistics or the laws, it wasn't an easy work. And honestly, it was a, like, like a collaboration of six different big nonprofit organizations working on pushing the policy. And we had to communicate and connect with um, like professors and faculty members who are interested on the women and gender studies and we started talking to them and involving them in in the discussion and we even added like so for the university to let us push the the policy and the unit we had to give them all the credit of course so and we weren't we we didn't have any problem with giving them the credit of doing everything and put their name on the like the promotion stuff if it gonna make the work done so it wasn't easy like I told you like every single step took like two years so the law we started talking about the the uh, the policy from the end of 2012 or the beginning of 2013 and it was official at the uh, like the mid of 2014 or the end of 2014 so it, it took about two years of negotiation and workshops and like uh, 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 definitions and uh, yeah it was a long process I hope I, I, I answered your question yes absolutely thank you so much Habiba well, I would like to end this by just saying thank you so much, and not just for your delivery of your workshop today or your session today that provided us with lessons learned from this movement, but also to say thank you because I think you have been um, 
so incredible in not just sharing that with us today, but in thinking about the work that we do here locally on sexual violence prevention. Um, you know, you have been an incredible volunteer for us in regards to Take Back the Night before you were employed here. Um, and then you have been instrumental in so many aspects of our program that I just want to say thank you so much because you have continued to, to help people think about how it is that they navigate sexual violence prevention, domestic violence prevention, all sorts of interpersonal violence. And so um, thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, and I see people amplifying in the chat how much um, engagement with you has, has meant. And so um, thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much for having me and for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marie. Thank you.